Today it seems everybody has an opinion about the stock market and how to make money. Consuelo Mack, the host of PBS's new show, Consuelo Mack Wealth Track, has some new opinions about how you can build wealth and be profitable and productive while doing it. And one of my all-time favorite guests, Dolly Parton. Investor. There were some positive inflection points that fired you think inflation is going to go and how much of a problem. The reason I started Consuelo Mac Wealth Track is it's about long-term diversified investing. And there's no other program on television that talks about long-term diversified investing. All the financial news programs talk about stocks only and also about what's happening today or this quarter at the, you know, at the mm -hmm. longest period of time. But that's not how people make money. The, the average person, they're just you and, and I, make money essentially thinking about our long-term investment objectives. And we also buy other things aside from stocks. We buy bonds. We invest in cash. We buy real estate. We buy jewelry, oh, yes. art, antiques, <laughs> collectibles. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we have insurance products. So I wanted to address all of those issues and, and talk to the very best people in each of those fields about how you can build wealth and protect them in, in all of the investments you care about. What would be one of the great pieces of advice you've learned from your show that you could share with other viewers? Because one of the things on WealthTrack that we, we talk about, not only building wealth, but also protecting wealth. So we've had an expert on risk, for instance. And what he said is that you've got, there are a lot of you know, possibilities out there. I mean, you, know, you could get hit by a bus tomorrow or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And then you don't want to devote a lot of time to that, but you have to be aware that there are certain events that could happen that could be absolutely devastating financially. And one of them that we discovered was disability. Now, I didn't have disability insurance. Uh, a lot of people don't. They think they don't need it. But it turns out that I think it's something like 30 or 40 percent of home foreclosures are caused by someone becoming disabled, even for a short period of time, because most people depend on their paycheck is what supports them and their family. So it's how important something like disability insurance can be in that just in case you hope you never have to use it, but if you do need to use it and it's there, it can basically save you from financial ruin. What led you to this career? I started out on Wall Street because I had a liberal arts education and I wanted to learn about uh, business and a man's world. And there were two places that were hiring when I graduated from college in the 1970s. And they, those were the banks and the brokerage firms. And they were not only hiring women who didn't know anything about business, but they also would train you and pay you at the same time. And having graduated from college, I figured it was time for myself to uh, stand on my own two feet and I wanted to, to make a living and also learn something about business. So that's how I got involved in Wall Street. Well, you started there, but then you kind of transitioned. You did a sideways, actually. I did. And, but at, at the end of about five years, um, I figured out that the things that I loved doing were reporting on what the market was doing, reporting in the economy, and then telling my clients what was happening in the world and what it would mean for the markets. But the part I hated was actually making an investment decision because whenever the market went against me, which it frequently did in the 1970s, um, I would have sleepless nights. I just I couldn't stand losing money for my clients. So I figured out that there was one part of the job I loved, but the, the other part, the most important part, which was making money for your clients, <laughs> I couldn't stomach. So um, I was trying to figure out what can I do with this information I have. I don't want to be in Wall Street, so where can I go? My brother is a journalist. My grandfather was a journalist. So I took some classes after work at a place called the New School in New York, in one in broadcast journalism and the other in print journalism, and I fell in love with the broadcast journalism class. From a part-time reporting job, Consuelo was quickly propelled to the big time, anchoring the Wall Street Journal report, a position she held for 17 years. Well, after two months of market losses, the stock market began the new week and the new month with the Dow Industrials making a rebound. Women, traditionally, though, have kind of stayed away from handling money. They're afraid of it. And that's changing. That's changing a lot. Um, it's, it's interesting, uh, when, when you look at statistics, uh, I know that, that Merrill Lynch has done some, some research, for instance, on women investment patterns and men's investment patterns and that women are actually much more conservative than men therefore believe it or not they actually make better investment decisions than men do and they're more willing to talk to experts and not only that is with the baby boomer generation and our parents generation and the baby boomer generation that more women are 
inheriting assets and also they're making more money now since more women work. So they actually have far more wealth in women's hands than ever before in history. And we're going to have to learn how to handle it. Absolutely. Well, when you look back at some of the people, and you've interviewed everybody about finances and about business, is there anybody that stands out as being kind of an interesting juxtaposition? Dolly Parton. Yeah. <laughs> it's right hard to miss Dolly. Dolly Parton uh, <laughs> is a very astute businesswoman. She will not put a figure on what she's worth. Your fortune is estimated at anywhere from 200 to 400 million dollars. What is it really? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't go around. I count my blessings more than I count my money. Uh, that's what I hear and I'm shocked myself when they say that I hear all those figures thrown around. From the beginning started, you know, wrote her own songs, became her own record producer, became her own tele television producer, and uh, now she's uh, she's running this phenomenally successful uh, entertainment park called Dollywood uh, in her, you know, in her home area of the Tennessee Smoky Mountains. And she's just a, a real hoot and a holler, and she laughs at herself, and she keeps reinventing herself. While you were starting your career, you also got married. Yes. You got married at 24. Right. When you decided to have children, you have one son. That was really also, you were a little bit ahead of the curve because you were a late onset mother. It's it, now, of course, I'm the norm. But, uh, but the decision to have, I, I intentionally delayed getting pregnant and having children. Uh, because I was so wrapped up in my career, and I know that you know we're we're talking about balancing your career and your family, and my feeling was that in my in the early days of my career that that there was no, not going to be any such thing as balance. That I was a total workaholic. That in order to do what I wanted to do, that I needed to work all the time, and so therefore I decided I really didn't want to have children right away. Well, in retrospect, looking back now, you know, getting pregnant in my th late thirties. It was a much riskier proposition that I realized it was not a problem for us. We were very lucky, but I realized, and if I were, um, you know, to give advice to young <laughs> women now, I'd say uh, it probably isn't worth the risk waiting that long. And I think that women now are a lot smarter about balancing work and career than I was. We were pioneers. I, you know, we really there were no other role models out there that actually ba had. had both a family and uh, and a career. You either had one or the other. I don't know. Do you think it has changed today, or do you think the young women feel that they have to still keep at it quite so hard? I think it's changed. I, I really do. I, th I think that there is a, a recognition, uh, number one, uh, that a lot of young women and, and young men, is for, for that matter, have seen with their parents uh, the, the struggles that they went through. Number one, men are much more involved in child rearing than they used to be. Um, number two is that a lot of women realize that a career is, can last a long time, and so that and and companies are more willing to to accommodate uh, the, the talented, you know, young women that they have. They recognize that that one of the unique things that we do is is bear <laughs> children, and that it's a very valuable thing that we do, and it's part of our lives. And so there's much more accommodation now. Uh, businesses and and professionals didn't know how to handle it uh, when I was uh, starting out. How do you unwind? What do you do when you have time off and you just want to get rid of the pressures of the world? Because you know, one of the things to get rid of pressures is, and now they're finding out that this is very important, is exercise. So I'm, you know, I've always been physically very active. So I work out, I play tennis, I, I run, uh, and I, <laughs> whenever, and I, and I know that they say that you can get by on less sleep, you know, you're less prone to depression that exercise to me is essential. And if I don't get exercise, uh, and anyone who works with me knows this as well, if I don't eat regularly, I get very cranky. So I've learned to feed myself and also <laughs> run around a lot. But that's how I really de-stress. It's so interesting. So many of the women I've spoken to say exercise, exercise. Yeah. And even though people give it lip service, but how do you actually go out and do it? What do you advise people? Just well, the, the, there, were, there was a period of time when, when my son was young and when I really wasn't exercising that much. And, you know, I, I basically, and I've heard other people, women say this as well, is that they, they make an appointment to do it early before anyone gets up or first thing in the morning because otherwise the day gets away from you. So as much as I would prefer not to exercise at, you know, 6 or 6.30 in the morning, that's when I do it because, uh, because then I have the rest of my day. Well, I have two last questions for yes. you. The first is, what's on your bedside table? What are you reading? I'm reading The Smartest Guys in the Room, which is about Enron, and I'm also reading a, uh, a biography of Buddha by Karen Armstrong. Mm. 
So talk about two totally different <laughs> well, realms. Well, you have to have. But balance, balance is very important. And my last question would be, tell me something about you that nobody knows. Oh, Alan, you know everything. I don't know everything, but <laughs> almost, almost. Uh, <laughs> well, a, a lot of people wouldn't think this, but I still get extremely nervous before I'm, I do my show and, and also before I appear before a group of people when I MC things. So it's definitely, I'm Stage one of those people fright. who has to really prepare before I do anything. I do not do, do, I do very few things extemporaneously because I need to feel really prepared. And that's also tends to be, can be a, a women thing as well. They really want to know what they're talking about before they open their mouths. <laughs> Present company excluded. <laughs> Thanks so much for being with me today. It was oh, great to visit with you. Great to be here, too. Thanks. Tumbo and her husband, basketball superstar Dikembe, have dedicated their lives to helping people in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But Rose has a mission all her own, and we're here at her home in Pennsylvania to find out what that mission really is. Rose, thank you so much for having us in your home and letting us interview you today. Thank you for coming. I'm really, really excited to be here. We've been trying to do this interview for, I think, about a year and a half. I know. <laughs> Why has it been so difficult to get together? My schedule, you're a busy person, I'm a busy person trying to coordinate my traveling, the family, the school, but finally we got to meet, so I'm glad. Yeah, I'm very happy about it. You um, have a very unusual life. You're married to a basketball superstar. He's living in Texas. You're here in Philadelphia. How, how did you wind up living in two different cities? Uh, one reason, first of all, I'm in school. I'm in school and I have a um, bunch of children and some are young and some are older and then school here so I wasn't sure the idea of moving and moving all the children uh, transferring my to a different school I just thought it was too much so I kind of decided to stay here and see how things will go and it's been pretty much working good for us. Well this school is not ordinary school you're in nursing school Correct. and this is something that you decided to do because why? This is something I always want to do. As I was growing up as a little girl, I dreamed to go to medical school. And uh, meeting my husband and getting married kind of flipped a little bit my idea and my goal. Um, I was planning to go to medical school to become a doctor. After getting married, I just thought it was no way um, I decided to go to nursing school. Of course, it did take me a few years to go back to that. but. Finally, that's the reason I'm going to nursing school. So how difficult is it being in school and having young children and adopted children? It is very difficult. It really, really demands a good uh, sense of organizing, a good uh, way of knowing what are your priority. Once you have children, school is not really, really my priority. So I have to prioritize things. My children are first, and school is kind of second. But being international and English being my, se my second language, school have been a great challenge, a really big challenge. But I'm loving it, I'm enjoying it. Have you had to get some help with that? I do. Actually, before I go back for nursing school, I spent about two and a half, three years taking English as a second language. So believe me, I've been in school for a long time. And how did you wind up, though, in Philadelphia? Because you know, Dikembe first was in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and yet you're going to nursing school here. Is it that the nursing school is so good here, or? Uh, my husband played for the Atlanta Hawks and got traded here to Philadelphia, and uh, he just ended up that being where I live now in Philadelphia, in Villanova, and Villanova University being closed, and I kind of learned a little bit about Villanova. It's such a great school and have a very, very amazing nursing program. So that's one of the reasons I decided to stay here and go there. Now, the adopted children mm -hmm. you brought from the Congo, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And are they relatives or nieces, nephews? How did you wind up adopting them? They are, for all four of them, they are Dikembe nephew and nieces. 
So when we met back home and decided to get married, we decided to adopt those children. They were living with my father and mother-in-law. And uh, they came back and asked me if I was willing to adopt them. I was young, but uh, I took the challenge. It had been a very long journey, but I'm grateful that I did so. When you look at these little children that you have and you imagine them grown up, what kind of dreams do you have for them? Do you think or hope that they'll follow in your footsteps? Definitely, I'm always looking at my children. And uh, if I have a really to choose for them, I'll, all, I will want all of them somehow to be in the medical field. In any career in the medical field, just? Any career, doctors, nurses, you know, doctor, nurses particular, being able to carry on and help if possible. Now, I'm curious about how your life is different from the life your parents led. My life is completely different. First of all, I have a famous husband, so I have to adjust to accommodate to NBA play or whatever life, which I've been able, and I think uh, I'm dealing with that. And my husband traveled a lot. Um, I was always in a family where both mom and dad was there constantly, which is not the case. My husband, it's all, he's always gone. So being home, I will say I'm pretty much like the mom and dad at the same time. I have to fulfill both responsibility of mother and father. And is it difficult then when he comes home because he's going to be the head of the household and you have to step back? How do you work out that balance? <laughs> it is not difficult because there is some routine. Uh, there is some routine and some role in the house that when he, when he comes, he just has to kind of work with it. <laughs> we cannot change much uh, because that will be just disturbing. So once he comes, there is things that he just have to be that way and he just have to comply. And, so he's the one who has to roll with the punches. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's kind of the reverse. From it is kind of the reverse, but that's the way it works. Talking about famous husbands, mm -hmm. I think being married to anybody that's famous and in the limelight is a challenge. And basketball superstars, like any of the sports players, there are a lot of rumors and women that follow them around. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that in a marriage? I think the very, very first thing is the relationship you have with your husband and uh, knowing your husband and trusting your husband. That's never, never been an issue in my marriage. I know my husband very well and I trust him and I, I limit myself there. But certainly the publicity that falls out of the Kobe Bryant type affairs have to have some backlash for mm -hmm. you. What does it make, what, what does it bring up for you? Sometimes I'll worry, I'll ask myself so many questions because as the guys on the road, you really don't know what's going on. But at the same time, you don't want to focus on that. You want to focus on goods and how good your relationship is with my husband and knowing my husband. So I, I really don't let myself forget on all, the, all of those things, no. Is there a camaraderie between the basketball wives at all? Or do you even see them because your life is so different? I do. I do occasionally. Um, we do have um, every year during the All-Star break, mm -hmm. uh, our Behind the Bench, which is an association of uh, um, basketball wives, where we get a chance to see each other and hang out a little bit. And is that fun? It is fun. It is very, very fun. What do you all talk about? Talk about how we should carry ourselves as uh, famous and athletes' wives. How can we be able to be involved in society and make differences? How we can reach other and um, just make a difference? Do you think that's a big focus today, making a difference? It is a big focus. It is a big focus, and I would want everybody, every woman, somehow, no matter our busy lives, to get involved. Um, making difference is so important. It doesn't matter how big it has to be. The little difference you can make, it's still important. You have said that your dream is to travel the world as a nurse. Is this really a new dream or was this something that happened long ago? I would say it's a new thing. Um, I initially, uh, before I get married, as I was planning on going to medical school, the whole idea was to help my people. Now, with my husband, the combination of us and seeing his involvement in the world, and this is something I always enjoy, though, and admire, 
So I decide that um, I don't need a study job. Financially wise, I think I'm blessed enough. And I just thought the traveling around the world, going in all underprivileged area, giving back, helping, um, it's important. And with my nursing skill, I think that's something I can easily, easily do. Now, you're going to be finished with your nursing degree in a year. Mm -hmm. And Dikembe is going to be playing for the Houston Rockets another year. Mm -hmm. What do you see the year after that? The year after that, I'm seeing a lot of traveling together, going in all different areas, helping, making differences. Definitely, uh, a year after that, I'm seeing a lot of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Mutombo more exposed than Dikembe Mutombo himself. Mr. and Mrs. <laughs> exactly. Okay, that's a good thing. Now, why did you and Dikembe decide, though, to start this endeavor in the Congo to build this hospital? They did something that uh, my husband always dreamed. I remember early on when we met, we got married, he started talking about, I was like, is he sure what he's talking about, building a hospital? But uh, going in the Congo, knowing the need, I kind of really, really support and I think it was a wonderful thing. So I kind of joined him. The main focus of the Dikembe Mutombo Foundation is the construction of a new 300-bed general hospital in the Congo's capital city of Kinshasa. Named in honor of Dikembe's late mother, Biamba Marie Mutombo, the hospital will be the first new medical facility to be constructed in the Congo in 40 years. You are really an amazing woman. Do, do you realize that you're a philanthropist? Do you see yourself that way? It's very funny. I don't. I don't. I'm glad that you mentioned that. I will dream of, but uh, I've not been able to grasp that and accept that I am. How do you see yourself? Uh, I see myself as a great human being, able to reach other and make differences in their life. That's something I believe in. That's something I'm capable to do. When you look ahead, mm -hmm. not just one year ahead, but 20 years ahead, how do you imagine your life with Dikembe and what will you be doing? I, uh, hmm. a lot, a lot of traveling, a lot, a lot of involvement with different charities, a lot, a lot of uh, teaching awareness about the different um, diseases such as HIV, awareness about some of uh, the disease that uh, we don't talk about in this country that is still killing millions and millions million of children in Africa, such as polio, uh, there is a malaria issue. I'm seeing myself being very involved and very, uh, very advocate about those issues, awareness of those issues. Thank you so much for having us today, Rose. It was really a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming and taking your time out of your busy schedule. Thank you. That's great. Do you ever wonder about the choices women have made throughout history? I have some stories for you. When it comes to women who've made a difference, Muriel Siebert's name isn't usually mentioned. But Siebert changed the face of high finance in America forever when she became the first woman to buy her own seat on the New York Stock Exchange in 1967. Thanks to Muriel Siebert and others like her, women today are a huge force in the world of finance and business. Becoming financially savvy is a smart step for all women. Try it. We have all kinds of interesting information to share with you on our website, balancingyourlifeonline.com. I'm Ellen Sussman. Thanks so much for joining us. Until next time. Balancing Your Life is made possible in part by
the Lee and Joseph D. Jamail Foundation, J.P. Morgan Chase, Sarah S. Morgan, Fred Barron and Lisa Blue. Additional funding is provided by the Lori M. Tisch Foundation, Andrea and Jim Gordon, Goldman Sachs, Amagi Bank, I.W. Marks Jewelers, Terrell W. and Joan B. Oxford, and others. For a complete list, visit us at www.balancingyourlifeonline.com.